Hello, I'm Scott Glover with the uh, Mid-America Flight Museum in Mount Pleasant, Texas, and Eric Johnson's nice enough to come down and uh, we're going to film a walk around uh, around this very historic uh, uh, C-41. Um, and I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I've kept up with this airplane uh, since 2010 is when I first saw this particular airplane at the gathering of DC-3s up in uh, Sterling Rock Falls. We have a C-47 uh, dubbed Sky King. It was a very historic aircraft. It flew a lot of missions in World War II. In fact, one of the most historically documented combat aircrafts of World War II. So I was there with that aircraft and, and this aircraft was, was there. And this one's got a very unique uh, VIP history. Uh, Douglas uh, Aircraft Company built the DC-3 and the first flight was uh, December 17, 1936. And it was built for the commercial airline industry. Uh, it really had no intentions of selling air, uh, these aircraft to the uh, United States government. So it did it all on its own and it was a very, very successful airplane in the airlines. Um, fast forward a couple of years, the United States government had a need for a, uh, a VIP transport aircraft. So they got with Douglas and they put together their requirements and they built this aircraft and it was a 12 passenger uh, aircraft dubbed a uh, C-41 and they only built one C-41 and the airplane was built uh, in October uh, let's see October the 20th of 1938 and the US uh, Air Corps uh, took delivery of it on uh, October the 22nd 1938 uh, it flew to Washington DC which is now Andrews Air Force Base and it flew as a VIP transport uh, from 1938 to 1945. It flew just under 3,000 hours during that period of time. The, uh, the, the person that it was really built for was uh, General Hap Arnold. Hap was a two-star general at the, uh, at the time. He's got an amazing history if you go and you research some about Hap Arnold. Um, he was actually the second military officer to receive a pilot's license by the Wright's Flying School in 1911. I believe his pilot's license number was number 29. And so we've got photographs, and maybe Eric will uh, zoom in on one here in a minute. We've got photographs of Hap Arnold sitting in this left seat of this aircraft in 1938. So it's an amazing amount of history before we entered the war. Uh, and it was a VIP transport. So. Uh, they didn't run around in this airplane to Hawaii, play golf like the, uh, the leaders do today. Uh, this, uh, this airplane, I would imagine when it was flown, it was, was on pretty important business meetings. If, uh, if it could only talk and the planning that was going on from 38, 39, and 40, uh, it would be amazing to hear the stories that were told in this airplane, the planning that really probably, probably took place uh, for the war effort uh, in this particular airplane. So uh, that said, it, there's a lot of misinformation about the Douglas C-41. You go on the internet, you, you Google C-41, you'll find out that some really big time folks, Air Force Museum and other researchers uh, claim that this was a DC-2 derivative and it's got all this kind of stuff. Uh, all that is 100% false, I can tell you. It's a Douglas DC-3 platformed airplane that was modified at the factory to meet military specifications, but it's a Douglas DC-3 all around. It did have 900 horse Pratt & Whitney 1830-21 engines, which I'd actually never heard of, 900 horse engines. So I would imagine it was a little bit of a dog uh, when it was first built in 1938, compared to where it is now. Probably in 38, it was an amazing airplane. But it did have the smaller engine, similar to that of a DC-2, but it is a DC-3 all the way up, all the way around. Uh, with that, we'll just do a quick, quick quick walk around. The airplane, uh, another little bit of a history, the airplane after it served uh, for the government as a VIP transport, it then went into FAA service and it remained in FAA service up until the 1970s. And then once it left FAA, uh, it went to Otis Spunkmeyer and I believe they had a total of three DC-3s that they used to promote their cookies and then they also gave rides around the San Francisco Bay Area and and so this did that it was a painted aircraft at the time and then right there at the end I think that they discovered that hey this was actually a Hap Arnold airplane uh, just like a lot of airplanes with with the uh, with 
technology that allows us to research, they found out it had quite a colorful history. So uh, they decided to go ahead and strip the aircraft, polish it, and put it back uh, pretty much as it was when it flew with, uh, with Hap Arnold back in the day. If you look right up under the uh, window of, uh, of where the pilot sits, you'll see the serial number. Um, 38502 and that's the military serial number if you go and you google you'll see 38502 that it is in fact the uh, the C41 again we got a photograph right there a really amazing photograph with that exact uh, uh, bit of information under it this is an early DC3 and compared to others there are differences uh, some DC3s actually and certainly the C47s have what we call a hamburger door right behind the pilot seat this one does not and this one does not have the escape hatch over the uh, the pilot and to be honest with you I don't know if that was a DC-3 thing or if in fact that was a C-47 thing but our C-47 has the hamburger door here and then it has also the uh, the escape hatch uh, there this one just has the escapes over the wing and then the back door uh, pretty much from there it's a it's it's a standard DC-3 95 foot 2 inch wingspan it's a little over 64 feet uh, 64 feet long uh, it's just a, just an amazing aircraft. In fact, we picked it up in Oakland a couple days ago and, uh, and flew it to uh, Mount Pleasant, Texas. We're getting true air speeds uh, around 9,000 feet. It's, it's true and out around 150 knots. So uh, it, it puts along pretty nice. Again, it came with the 1830-21 900-horse engines, but they were modified later on after the war to uh, a more modern engine. This is an 1830 again, uh, dash 75 engine. It's a 1350 horse engine at rated power. Uh, so it's, it's, got, it's got quite a lot of power. It does very, very well. The 1830 means it's 1830 cubic inches. It's, it's a combination of uh, two banks of uh, nine cylinders. So we've got 18, uh, 18 cylinders. It's a double bank engine. Some of the DC-3s actually had the right powered uh, 1820 engines, 1820 cubic inches. They had nine cylinders, just one single bank. So larger cylinders, much, but, but still a, about the same amount of displacement and about the same amount of horsepower. We'll go ahead and kind of walk around. Uh, this airplane is actually equipped. Uh, this is the only one that I have seen. There may be others. This is equipped with the original exhaust stack with the uh, with the heater so it's just kind of like your Cessna 172 cold air comes in it's heated through the exhaust and it comes right in the cabin it's actually really effective I don't know why people took these things out uh, but it's very very effective heat we have left and right it goes across so we don't have a gasoline heater which I really like but you know even on a summer day at 10 11 thousand feet it gets a little chilly so coming home we pop those on a little bit and it really really made the cabin nice this one is equipped with the ice boots, but they are actually inactive. But they're actually in good shape, and they're 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 good abrasion uh, uh, boots right now. Uh, a very powerful landing light, even for 1938. You turn this thing on on short final, and you think you're in a jet. I don't know how they get that much light out of that uh, out of that lens, but they really do. It's it's a very powerful powerful light, good light back in the day. Again, a 95 foot two inch. Wingspan, a DC-3 has all uh, conventional controls. They're all cable. It's a little bit heavy on the controls. Uh, it flies almost as you would expect it to fly. It, it's really, really amazing airplane. The, uh, the flaps on a DC-3 are split flaps, so they don't really produce hardly any lift. You really wouldn't use flaps on takeoff unless you were in extremely wet uh, grass type runway. And, and, uh, but even in that case, just keep it tail low flaps up because pretty much the flaps on a DC-3 are just just for drag drag only again this airplane uh, is as it was uh, most of the skins are original uh, I haven't gone through the entire logbook but it has not been reskinned and they're in amazingly good shape but it's not perfect you'll see a few dings and dents you know for an airplane of this age it's in remarkably good shape uh, DC-3 has standard fuel tanks uh, we, we always call them 200 gallons a piece actually the front tanks 204 gallons the rear tanks right at 200 gallons I think 202 is what the book says so basically you've got uh, 800 gallons of fuel and in round numbers you burn about 100 gallons an hour so you got eight hours to dry tanks you can fly seven hours in a DC-3 without doing much math uh, and, and, and in reality up at cruise you're going to be burning around 90 gallons an hour take off climb out your first hour you'll be about 115 maybe something like that 
Uh, this airplane uh, is equipped with an air stair door. Uh, the, the differences between this and the C-47, C-47 would have had the, the large cargo door that you could put a Jeep in or you could put uh, a, a, a lot of equipment, but this was built as an executive airplane. Uh, our C-47 actually has an air stair door that is, is a little bit larger than this, uh, but this one here is a, it's, it's just a little bit smaller door, so I, I can't tell you much of the history about why this size door is on this airplane, but this door would not fit on our C-47. Um, the insignia right here, <coughs> excuse me, when, uh, when you're flying in the military, they would, they would always put uh, who the highest ranking officer of the aircraft was. So when you landed and pulled up, you knew that you had a two star on board. Uh, I think it, uh, maybe you got a little bit better service when you had a two star up here versus a lieutenant. But uh, this is actually inaccurate. Even though it's a two star, we've got a photograph of how this actually is. That's one of the first things we're gonna do. We're gonna reprint this. It would say uh, Army Air Corp on here, and it, it was actually a really beautiful uh, insignia that would have been on the airplane, and we'll get that changed. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's still an amazing, amazing piece of history. And if you can zoom in just a little bit, we need to polish the airplane again, but the rivets are in good shape, and uh, it, needs a, it needs a good polish job. Uh, we've got a polished Lockheed Lodestar, so we do know how to polish. Once you get an airplane mirrored out like this one pretty much is, probably three guys, uh, maybe seven days, would have this airplane back. It'll be rubbed on one time, and, and you're not taking off much metal at all doing that, just that initial, that, that, uh, that secondary polish. But if you get an airplane that's been sitting out in the boneyard for a long time, you really, it takes a lot of time per square foot to get it up. But this airplane here won't, won't, be, uh, won't be difficult at all. Uh, back here in the, uh, in the tail, uh, a DC-3 has got just a, uh, a tail wheel that is uh, lockable but not steerable. So really all you have for steering is differential power and brakes and then of course rudder. That's uh, a very, very effective, uh, very effective uh, tail tail wheel, very strong tail wheel on the airplane. Again, these things are made for, for operating off of very rough strips, grass strips, back in the day. Fabric controls, uh, elevator, ailerons, rudder, uh, very large. You take these off and it's almost the size of a cub wing. It's a, it's a very large elevator. These are in very good shape. Um, not much really else to say. It's a very conventional control. Uh, DC-3 takes, takes a fair amount of trim. Uh, to, to, to fly the airplane, although you can hold it, but as you change airspeed 10 knots, you'll want to retrim the airplane. It's very easy to do, large trim tabs. Pretty much just a conventional uh, airplane. I think it's one of the absolute most beautiful aircraft uh, built. In 1938, an airplane that was certified to carry 32 passengers, even by today's standard 2016, this is an amazing family aircraft. Uh, with 18 passengers in there, 100 gallons an hour, uh, an airplane that can fly seven hours. Uh, I had rather uh, I had rather uh, fly DC-3 than a jet any day of the week. Uh, just, just still an amazing airplane. Making our way around the other side, it's actually just the same trim tab on the aileron, and the exact same uh, exhaust system and heat system on this side. And with that, why don't we go ahead and take a tour through the, uh, the inside of the airplane. We'll let you see what it looks like. Okay, we're going to take a, uh, a, uh, a tour of the inside of this uh, Douglas C-41. Eric, follow me. We're inside uh, the uh, 1938 C-41, and when it was uh, first built and ordered by the government, uh, I've read that this was a 12 passenger executive interior. So this is obviously not the original interior in the airplane. I'm supposed to be getting some photographs of that so I can see really what it looks like. But the way we're outfitted right now is an 18 passenger configuration in the back and it's extremely comfortable. I had 18 passengers in it on my, on my first leg back in Sweetwater. We landed a lot of people around the airplane and, and, and uh, people who know me, I said, hey, let's go flying. So we loaded up 18 people, took them on a nice ride, and airplane didn't even know we had anybody in the back. It's really, really, really an amazing airplane. But this one is equipped very nice. It's got very, very large baggage area. If you, if you buy your DC-3 for your family, you will, you will not run out of baggage space. It's right back there in the back. We actually have a, a flushing potty 
right here. There's no carpet in here, but a nice flushing potty and a sink and a lav. Larger than any airline I've been on. Very nice galley back here in the back. Again, it's not original. I don't know that I physically will change it. Uh, it's it's nice. It's very practical. It's, this would be a great traveling airplane, a great airplane to uh, to do what we do to haul veterans in and make trips and be very comfortable. But again, 18 seats in the back. We got one set of clubs up here with a with a nice desk, and then we have uh, two 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 sofas, uh, three place each. At DC3, you'll notice you're really going uphill. A lot of people find it uncomfortable to walk up, or it's it's unusual. But you know, again, once you get in the air, everything's perfectly level. And and I've had other aircraft with couches, and you think, well, riding sideways is kind of crazy. It's it's not. The funnest experience on takeoff and landing necessarily but once you get up you're sitting across from each other and it's kind of a party i really enjoy the uh, the couches everybody does too so it's a lot of fun there's a bulkhead right here uh, this aircraft if we, once you look at the instrument panel it was a beautiful instrument panel it was well equipped for 1981 but they haven't done many modifications since then so that's one thing that i want to do is from here forward we're probably going to give it a pretty good facelift uh, uh, clean up the, uh, the headliner and, and probably rebuild some of the panels and put some modern avionics in it. I do like originality, but I like to be able to fly and be able to fly instruments very safely, so I don't mind having a Garmin up in the, uh, in the front right there. The uh, headliner back here, even though it looks pretty good, the mechanic told me that it's not going to come out one more time and go back in, so we'll probably go ahead and replace uh, this headliner. It was probably done in the early 1980s. The rest of the interior is actually in pretty good shape. Come on up and uh, we'll show you what's going on up here. Got 18 passengers in the back and running it uh, under Park 91. Uh, we're a 25,200 pound airplane. All DC-3s are 25,200 pound airplanes. A lot of misconception about that uh, with the FAA and actually some DC-3 owners. But people say they're a 26,200 pound airplane. but. Uh, but, or 26,900 some people say but in reality you can only do that if you're on an air carrier certificate part 125 uh, 135 or 121 but running part 91 25 2 is our max gross weight and I honestly don't know what the empty weight on this one is it's got an interior in it so it's probably a little over uh, 18,000 18 to 19,000 pounds probably so as long as our payload is under that uh, 6,000 pounds we can operate this under part 91 just like you would a bear and that's the way uh, that's the best way to do it you don't have to get a deviation letter from the FAA uh, really really makes it nice uh, uh, nice baggage area up front and this is a uh, an area uh, a, a table we have all of our circuit breakers the circuit breakers are actually really really nice in a panel here uh, I, I would love to clean this up and make it look a little better uh, this actually has an HF radio in it. Uh, the previous owner took it to Europe on uh, one of the uh, D-Day uh, celebrations they had. So it had a, it's equipped with HF and I'll definitely keep that in here. It's got some remote avionics that I'll probably end up taking out again, replaced with the Garmin. But come on up front and you can take a look at the, uh, the cockpit. And in a DC-3, there's, there's a lot of similarities between this, the C-47, the C-41. All of the important things are in exactly the same spot. Uh, hydraulics right here, our star valve, even though it's, it's slightly different, this would be our flaps uh, right here. Flaps up and flaps down and flaps neutral. And that's our landing gear right there. And there's, there's a, they, a lot of people make the uh, retracting and lowering the gear in a DC-3 a little bit more difficult than it really is. But when I teach people to fly these airplanes, I say think about it just as a, uh, you know, what do you call those, uh, those, those door locks, the, uh, what do you call those, Eric, just, just the, the, the dead bolts. So you got a dead bolt right here. So we've got a handle right down here that's basically your lock on your landing gear. So we want to retract the gear, obviously we can do it while we're on the ground, but you push this forward and you raise that handle up, and when you raise that handle up, then you open the deadbolt. Well, once you get the deadbolt open, then all you do is you grab the hydraulics right here, just like a Piper Apache, and you raise it and the gear comes up. It's so super simple. When you want to put the gear down, you just put the handle back in the down position. Landing gear goes down. When it gets all the way down, hydraulic pressure comes up 
and, and you know when the hydraulic pressure is all the way up, you've got all your cylinders full of pressure and full of fluid and, and they're down. And then you reach down and you lock the deadbolt. If you try to open your door in your house and your deadbolt's in, it's not going to open. Well, the gear's not going to retract either. Likewise, if you have the gear up and somebody steps on that and you shut the deadbolt on your door on your house and you put the gear down, the door will close and the gear will go down, but it'll stop before it, it locks. So once you think about it like that, it's, it makes it really, really simple to operate. A lot of people just get that so confused and so it's actually really, really simple. Trims here for a DC-3, you got, uh, you got your elevator trim, you got your rudder and aileron. They're very effective, they're cable driven, very smooth. Fuel tanks over here, you can, you can operate any engine off of any tank. It is so simple. Left aux is the left rear, left main, so that would be the left front, right front, right uh, aux, and off. So there's really no crossfeed in a DC-3. You just select what tank you want the engine to run off of and it just runs. It's really, really an amazingly simple airplane. I don't know why aircraft manufacturers today didn't copy the DC-3 and just make it simple. But gosh, some of these fuel systems are so complex. They're pretty straightforward. Prop controls here, throttle controls here, and mixtures. And in mixtures, you have three positions on these, on these Pratt & Whitney's. You have uh, normal, uh, uh, what we call auto rich, and if you go all the way forward, you have an emergency rich position that basically dumps fuel in the carburetor in the event of a carburetor failure or an emergency. And then you come back to what we call auto lean or cruise. And to do that, so we're taking off an auto rich. Just grab this right here and you pull it back until it stops. And there is auto lean. Auto lean will save you about 10 to 15 gallons an hour per engine if you had fuel flows. We operate so many aircraft here at the museum. There's almost 30 aircraft, and, and a lot of them have these big engines. And so, even even the Corsair, we we pretty much have standardized all of our power settings to a takeoff power of around 40 to 45 inches in whatever RPMs we get. And then Mito power, we bring them back to 4024. That works on every airplane we got. Is uh, come back to 4024 after you get the gear coming up. And then our climb power setting is 3523. And then once uh, once we get to altitude, we come back to 3020. If we're just giving a tour, you can obviously come back on your power a little bit to save a little bit of fuel. But in uh, in operating as many airplanes as we do, we we brief our uh, our uh, all of our pilots are briefed to use those same power settings. Obviously, captain's got he can use whatever power setting he wants to. This airplane will go to 50 54 inches and you're not going to hurt the engine by doing it, but we certainly wouldn't want to use 54 inches every time. Um, pretty much that's it. it again, it's 1980 80 technology on the, uh, on the avionics that we want to get cleaned up. And maybe a little bit later on, we can get Eric to come back and we can take it around the patch and uh, do a good video of, uh, of flying the DC-3. I really appreciate you guys taking uh, taking interest in this video. I appreciate Eric uh, taking the time to come out here and do this. And then our website is uh, midamericaflightmuseum.org. And our Facebook page is Mid America Flight Museum. So uh, go and, uh, and like us and keep up with what we're doing. We really appreciate it. Okay. Well, we're, we're sitting in the cockpit of, uh, of the C-41, uh, November 41 Hotel Quebec. But one thing I want to show you uh, about the airplane that's really, really unique are the data plates. And they're, they're just, it's, kind of the, uh, it's kind of the history of the aircraft. And this is the data plate from Douglas Aircraft. And you can see it says uh, C-41 is built in October of uh, 20th of 1938. And it shows the engine, uh, an 1830-21 900 horse engine. So again, a lot smaller engine than what we got on the airplane right now, but this is the original data plate. Two days later, it was, it was assigned to or purchased by the Army Air Corps, and they put their data plate on here. And you can see it's 38502 is the, uh, all the military data plates uh, are serial numbers for all the airplanes. It doesn't matter if it's Corsair or DC-3, uh, is the, the first two numbers is always the year that they, uh, that they accept the airplane. Um, so to, to, to have, this airplane and to have the original data plates is really amazing. Again, 
this data plate's pretty much clear up a lot of the confusion. If people had just looked at them, uh, it would have been great. But uh, a lot of confusion and misinformation out there on the Douglas C-41. I almost call it the mystery ship. Of course, that's the travel air. But uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of confusion about the C-41. It's kind of fun to tell the story. And uh, a couple of people on our Facebook pages already tried to correct me and that, hey, this is really a DC-2. I said, no, it's really not. Let me talk to you about it. But they, again, they, they just read the information by supposedly really good sources that had it wrong. Kind of fun. But anyway, uh, that's the data plate sitting right above the, uh, the hydraulic, uh, hydraulic tank and, and the, uh, the star valve in the uh, Douglas DC-3. And there's Matt. And there's Matt Bungers. He keeps this thing running. And all the other airplanes.